So I did threaten to do another video on Stuart Taylor and Casey Johnson's book, The Campus Rape Frenzy, in particular with reference to some of the unbelievable stories of young men being railroaded out of universities on dubious charges of sexual assault and because of extremely biased adjudication processes that completely violate any sense of due process. But instead of me retelling a story out of the book, I'll let one of the authors, Stuart Taylor, do the talking. The following was cut from an hour-long book TV interview on C-SPAN in March this year. It starts out with a summary of the main thesis of the book, then Taylor briefly describes two cases, and then he gives some advice to young men attending college today. Now I would normally say enjoy, but if you're a young male entering university on a US campus, I think it's more appropriate to say pay attention to Taylor's advice. Share for the viewers, um, what's your general thesis? That, that we're looking at here. What are we going to be reading about when we open the pages? The gist of it is that there's been a huge myth uh, that's taken root, uh, that there's an epidemic of campus rape, <clears throat> that there's a culture of campus rape where it's con encouraged and condoned even by the administrators, uh, that this is out of control, that it's increasing, that it's worse on campus than it is off campus, and that it requires completely demolishing all due process and the presumption of innocence for the accused people, 99% of whom are male, and that's mm -hmm. not an accident. Uh, this comes from extreme feminists, uh, uh, you know, male-hating extreme feminists in some cases, but it also was enormously pushed ahead by the Obama administration, because the Obama administration, I think for political reasons, uh, latched on to this idea well into the Obama administration. They were quiet about it for two years, and then suddenly, bam, for reasons I can describe, uh, they ordered every campus in the country, every college in the country that receives federal money, which is more than 7,000 of them, to revolutionize their disciplinary processes to make sure that if any, they, not only if a woman complained that she'd been raped or sexually assaulted, if her roommate's best friend complained, that they uh, get to the bottom of it, have an investigation, have an adjudication of sorts, uh, discipline the guy, and follow specified rules they were clearly designed to presume guilt. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with, and I'll come back to, to some of your, um, your, your comments later, but I want to start with... Um, I should add that every piece of the myth that I described is false. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start with um, the case that you opened the book with, and that is uh, the Amherst student who you name, and it's a pseudonym, uh, Michael Chang, and his accuser, Alice Stanton. Uh, can you walk us through this case, first of all, just give us the, the sort of the highlights of what happened here, and then tell us why you decided to lead with this case. Sure. To answer the second question, first, there, there were so many cases we could have led with. There were maybe 30 or 40 that would have mm -hmm. sufficed perfectly well to make. So why this one? Uh, we thought this was one of the worst and one of the most emblematic and one of the most ironic because if there was a sexual assault in this case, it was the woman assaulting the man, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But the way Amherst saw it, they kicked out the man on the claim that he had assaulted the woman. And there were a number of factors that led to this that are sort of typical of what goes on, although the woman assaulting the man is less typical. Uh, first, uh, she had a motive for making up the idea that he had assaulted her. Okay, let's back up just a, a second. If you could sort of, what was the situation? The Can situation you just give us was, the basics? Yeah, yeah. A, a guy and a, and a woman who didn't know each other well in a dorm started making out and uh, having kind of uh, foreplay with clothes on, let's say, uh, in front of other people, and it became so sort of blatant and embarrassing to the other people. They said, why don't you all go get a room? So she took him back to her room, mm -hmm. and he was blackout drunk, which meant he didn't remember anything about it the next day. Mm -hmm. And the evidence suggests he was either passed out as well or close to being passed out. And she administered oral sex to him for whatever reason. Then she had had enough of him, sent him away, summoned another guy who she'd been flirting with earlier that day, said, get your military trained bod over here and entertain me, I'm alone. And then she had a sexual uh, encounter with him, which, which he, he was a little bit less ready to do than she was. We know all these facts because she was sending text messages mm. all along, one to, you know, to, a, to a campus friend. So she realizes at some point along here that this happens to be her roommate's boyfriend. 
the roommate is away. Suddenly she's Which worried. Which one is the uh, Michael Chang or the other guy? Michael Chang, the first okay. guy. Right. The, the guy who was blacked out drunk. <clears throat> I just want to make that clear. And uh, so she started telling people, oh, she was, you know, saying again more text messages. Oh my gosh, I've done something so stupid, uh, you know, I'm a, and nobody's ever going to, he's not going to be able to make up a good lie. So she ends up starting to tell people that, that he assaulted her when the reverse was true. Michael. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, and um, she told this to her social circle. She loses her first circle of friends. She starts hanging out with a bunch of militant anti-rape activists. And over a long period of time, she starts blogging and so forth. She starts telling more and more people that she was sexually assaulted. And finally, after more than a year, I think, she filed a complaint with Amherst College saying he sexually assaulted me. Mm -hmm. Amherst College did a sloppy investigation, didn't find any of the text messages that I'm talking about, for example, which could easily have been found. Um, a lawyer for the guy easily found them later without having to use, you know, just asked around, anybody got any text messages. Uh, convened a disciplinary panel of, I think it was three extreme feminists, I will call them uh, faculty types, and they, uh, you know, after violating every rule of fair process in the book, which they were commanded to do, by the way, the, by the Obama administration, they found him guilty and kicked him out. Then he hired a lawyer. The lawyer found the text messages. The text messages clearly proved his innocence. He took the text messages to Amherst, and they said, too late. You've been kicked out. It's over. And it, the, the saga continues in federal court, uh, but that's the gist of the case. Okay. women are often reluctant, even in the campus context, to report a right. real sexual assault. And it's legitimate for the campuses to say, well, let's encourage people to report by making it easier. Sure. They've done that, but they've done more than that. Give Yale a classic example. Yale, over and over again, more and more often, brings sexual complaints against guys when the woman did not complain or want to complain. Hmm. And the standing, outstanding example of this is Jack Montague, the Yale basketball captain, yes. who suddenly disappeared about a year ago from the basketball court. And it became apparent that he was being kicked out on account of a sexual assault allegation. Mm -hmm. Now, the woman did not make the allegation. She said she'd had an unhappy <clears throat> experience with him and told a roommate and somebody told somebody. Right. And it gets around to the campus sex bureaucrats. And that's what they are. They don't like the term, but they're campus sex bureaucrats, and they've been hired by the thousands under the Obama administration's commands. Uh, they decided, in part because they wanted to gratify themselves with the Obama administration, they decided that they were going to have an investigation and a kind of quasi-prosecution anyway, even though the woman didn't ask for it. This violated Yale's written rules, by the way, but they did it anyway. And not only did they do it, they misled the woman by telling her, oh, this guy had a prior record. He's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's not just you he did this to. Uh, so we, you know, we need to sort of take him out. And she testified on those grounds. Uh, in fact, his prior record had nothing to do with sex of any kind. Mm -hmm. And if you've got patience for what her testimony was, it's interesting, too. One of the more interesting conversations I had in this was with a female civil libertarian talking about her son and her daughter. She said, my daughter had a good head on her shoulders. She didn't get drunk. She didn't get naked in bed with people before she decided she didn't want to have sex with them. I didn't worry about her too much. I worried about her. I told sure. her to be careful. And, you know, bad things can happen. You know, right. she might get ridden, run over by a bus stepping off a street corner. But I didn't worry about her too much. And I, and I identify with that. She said, I worry about my son a little more because although the mathematical odds on him being falsely accused of rape or sexual assault may be fairly low still, I know, because this woman knows the system, that if he is accused, he's likely to be toast, no matter how strong the evidence of his innocence. Hmm. So uh, I, we, we say at the book at the end, you know, we advise your parent, be careful. Uh, we say, you know, you might check out the disciplinary systems at your college. But I also say in my own voice, if I had a son, I would tell him, you know, be a gentleman, uh, treat women with consideration, never make advances that you don't think are wanted, 
Um, but that alone is not going to guarantee you safety. You need to know that if you have sexual relations or foreplay with any woman who decides later that she wants to destroy you, she will have the power to do it. Hmm. So choose very carefully. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm mm -hmm. not going to say you need to be a monk. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we also say, by the way, <laughs> you know, if you stay away from women on your campus and date women from elsewhere, why you're a little bit less likely to end up in the hands because of the Because those proceedings are go aren't going to go the same way. Yeah. Now, but right. it's not a very satisfactory thing to say. I don't say take a television camera with you everywhere. <laughs> I don't say have her sign a waiver. Right. Um, and I don't say join a monastery. But, uh, but be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, oh, just, and hire a lawyer. If you're accused, bang. Don't think this is going to go well. I mean, yeah, you know, it'll be settled. I'm telling the truth. They'll be fair. No, they won't be fair. Hire a lawyer. The lawyer won't be allowed to participate in the proceeding, but he will be able to counsel you, do some good things, counsel mm -hmm. you, and in mm -hmm. the end, mm -hmm. sue mm -hmm. them if necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.